what does it feel like when you see your mom's reaction to getting the beach house? And can you feel the car turning the corner? It's about immersing yourself in that feeling as if it was going on right now. And when you do that on a daily basis, it's not long before reality catches up. Hey everyone, welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thank you so much for tuning in every single week to listen, learn, and grow. Now, you know that I like diving into the minds of unique individuals, people with incredible stories, fascinating backgrounds, people with insights that are gonna help us understand how we can level up our own mindset. Now, today's guest is gonna do just that. Today's guest is Russ, an American rapper, singer, songwriter, and producer. He's also the author of the USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestseller, It's All In Your Head. Russ has made 14 studio albums in his career with several of his songs going platinum and gold. His latest album, Shake the Snow Globe, came out in January of last year and debuted at number four on the Billboard album chart. Russ, welcome to On Purpose. That's Thanks for so being crazy. <laughs> it's just like crazy hearing those things out loud. I don't know. It just like trips me out sometimes. Yeah. How does I, it make you feel? Well, like every once in a while I unjade and I'm like, I go back to being 17 and I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> like, it's crazy. I'm how, super how, grateful. How would have your 17 year old self felt if they knew that this was going to be the life you lived? They would have thought I was lame that I didn't do it earlier. They would have been like, <laughs> they would have been like, took you to 28. What a loser. <laughs> but um, nah, I, I, like I'm one of those people where, you know, when, when people ask like artists or anyone like, oh, did you see this coming? It's like, well, yeah. How else do you make it happen? I don't even know how you would make something extraordinary happen if you don't have like an extraordinary level of belief. Yeah. I feel like there's a difference though, between like seeing believing and knowing like some people just mm, know yeah but i think sometimes we believe but knowing is like even a deeper like it is i know right do you know what i mean i agree with that that's interesting because i definitely when i was coming up it was it was that knowing feeling it was there was no doubt like doubt did not exist in my brain i knew that it was going to work and you couldn't tell me any different i feel like if we look at the world today especially what's happened in the last 12 months but even before that you see that there are a lot of people who doubt themselves. Why do you think we do that to ourselves? And how did you not fall into that? I don't know if it's necessarily age or if it's exposure to outside chatter. See, when I was 17, it was really easy to believe in myself because there was no one saying anything. Like there was no haters or I had nobody telling me you can't do it. Maybe some friends like joking like, oh yeah, you're going to be a rapper producer. But it's like, you know, I think a lot of it is you were, you're born a certain way. I think the other thing is good parenting. My parents, especially my dad, always told me I could do anything and would like constantly tell me I was special and all those things. And, you know, I know there's people who think that you shouldn't tell your kids certain things like that. But for me, I, you know, I really commend my dad for putting the battery in my back and making me think I can do anything I want because that's why I wrote a book. I don't read that much, but I was like, I could write a book. Why not? You know? So it's like, I don't know, man. Shout out to my dad. My dad is like the confidence guru. So Shout out to your dad. Yeah, I love hearing about a positive like father role model. Mine was more interesting. My dad was more aloof and detached. Interesting. Which actually helped me because it helped me craft who I wanted to be because right. I didn't have any pressure from him. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting how we all respond. That's funny you say that because then it just made me think that the other thing is, is I was always super, super competitive. And I looked up to my dad a lot. Like, he was really good at basketball. He was super smart. He could just, like, do anything. He's one of those people, like, he could just do anything. And, like, you ask him any question, he knows the answer to it. And since I'm super competitive, I was like, I have to be better than you. I have to, like, beat you at basketball. Like, he would always beat me at ping pong, pool. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just was always so competitive. So I think that really pushed me. He used to challenge me even with, like, school extra assignment projects where... He always loves telling this story. I think it's slightly overrated, but I'll tell it and he'll be happy that I did. Um, I think seventh grade, there was this class-wide or grade-wide uh, sort of like extracurricular thing like, oh, answer 200 of these math questions online and you'll get something. I don't know. 
And my dad just used to give me a hard time about not applying myself. So just to shut him up, I answered like all a thousand <laughs> and like won the whole thing. But like he usually, always uses that story as just sort of this way, this thing that I do where a lot of times I'll just do something to prove y'all wrong and prove me right, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Even if I don't really want to do it, but sometimes that's enough motivation. That's why I related to the Michael Jordan, the last dance thing where like he would use any little thing to be like, that was enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, like y'all yeah. pick Carl Malone as the MVP. That was enough. <laughs> that's how I'd be feeling. I only need a little bit. And sometimes I make them up in my head. I'm like, it's like a made make believe level of motivation, source of fuel. So Yeah. I've heard you talk about that before. Like this idea of having some level of delusion. Yes. And... One of my favorite people who had that, and uh, I've studied his his life through many books and teachings, is, is Steve Jobs. Mm. And so when you read the life of Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs had something they call reality distortion field, where he would distort the reality he experienced to be what he wanted it to be. Now, that can be very dangerous. Yeah. But it is can that also, like a real thing? That's like a, a psychological real thing. I believe so. That's for sure what my entire life was from like <laughs> 17 Now you got a word now. for it. Yeah, now, now it sounds wow. cool. So yeah, reality distortion field. So tell me about why do you think delusion is useful and where have you also seen it be dangerous? Because I think both is, is Well, I think it with. kind of depends on what reality you're trying to create. Mm. But I do believe in, you know, I used to walk around saying all my beats are a million dollars a beat and... I'm a billionaire and I just went platinum eight times. These are all things I would say like that would had not happened. And they were insane. Me and Bugis, my best friend who started Diamond, he put out a um a project back in 2011 and we called it 2020. And I produced the whole thing. And we did the entire album from the perspective of 2020. So it was like we're on Rolls Royces and we just made millions of like it was all just distorted reality. But it ended up becoming reality. So I do believe that if you want to change your reality, you have to already believe that it is your reality. But obviously, if you like are trying to do some evil or ill intent, it's not going to be great for everyone else. But. Yeah. Just before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, being creative and being busy. Mm -hmm. And you said something really interesting. You were just like, you know, I'm, I'm always creative. I've always got stuff going on here. And then you were like, there's some days where I don't, you know, I'm feeling lazy. Like... Walk us through that because yeah. as someone who's super creative, who's loved for your creativity yeah. and how original your work is, and that's why I've always liked you. I've always felt your sound is very original and Thank unique you. and it's hard to like be like, it's not, oh, it sounds like that person or it sounds like this. It's like, yeah. oh, no, no, this is original. Like that's where I've always resonated with your work. Tell us about how that is something you achieve even though there are days where you kind of feel like, I just want to sleep all day or whatever. Yeah. It's tough because uh, me and Bowie talk about it all the time. The highs and lows of an artist is really dramatic, at least for me. Like I'll have days, if I go into the studio and make something I love, I'm like on cloud nine, like everything is great in my life. But then I go to sleep and I wake up and that next day, none of that matters. Like I move on very quickly. And, I, and I'm just like, okay, now I need to make another one. But if I can't make another one, if that day I'm just not feeling it, or I go to the studio and I try and nothing works, I'm like, this is, uh, I should just give up. This is, this is it. I'll never get a creative source again. You know what I mean? And it gets very like, you sink really low sometimes, especially if you go, for me, I make so much music that if I don't make a song for four days, I'm like, this is crazy. Like what's happening? I'm depressed. So mm. it's hard, but you got to just remember that. Um, you just have to have faith in sort of the creator in the infinite. And, you know, I don't feel like I really make music. I feel like I deliver it, you know, because I feel like it, when I have those moments, it's just something that's coming to me and I'm the vessel and now I'm just delivering it and I'm executing it and I'm almost discovering it in the studio. I don't know if I'm creating it, I'm discovering it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you're not always going to be in that place where you're getting the message and you're getting the energy. So it just is what it is. It's just hard. It's the waiting time in between will make you feel like this is it. I'll never make another song again. <laughs> well, yeah. what makes you feel that? I love what you just said about delivering versus creating. I, I, I think that's phenomenal and it's yeah. explained really well. What makes you feel like you're in alignment where you can deliver versus forcing you to create? Like what are the things that- Lack of thought. Right. Yeah. Lack of thought. 
those times where you get into that place where you're not thinking and you're just feeling, and like I said, just delivering, like, I'm not even thinking about what, oh, should I say this? Like you get the inspiration and you just execute it. That's when you just enter that flow state and it's just special, you know, but it's tricky. It's hard. Especially, like I said, as I got, uh, not even necessarily older, just more visibility, there's outside chatter now in my head. You know, what people are going to think. I know that I'm not just releasing it to my friends anymore. Like, you know, so it's it's become trickier to tune out everything. But um, yeah, man, just try to focus on the present moment. That's yeah. like what the one thing that I learned this past year was really like, how do I slow down time? And I was like, okay, well, the way I slow down time is to slow down my thoughts. And the way I slow down my thoughts is to be present. You know, you notice if you're just mindless and you're, you know, you're making a sandwich, but you're thinking about, oh my God, what I need to do tomorrow. And what I, all of a sudden two hours passes, right? But if you really think about like, you know, you cutting the sandwich and what that's like, and you've stepping on the grass and what your feet feel like, time moves really slow. You realize how slow time moves. So I just try to do that. I try to stay in the present, even in the, in the studio, you know, I don't try to, uh, have my thoughts already be on when this comes out and this is going to be like this and how's it going to go. I'm just like, man, let me just like actually hear the music and feel the music and just operate from this place. I love hearing you talk about this, man, because, you know, these are some of the principles that I'm constantly sharing in my work. Yeah. But hearing how it applies to a music artist sure. in your career brings me so much joy. Yeah. Because it's practical. It's real. Like you've got time pressures you've got mm -hmm. you've got uh pressures from labels collaborations whatever yeah. it may be like there sure. are real life pressures but when i hear you say that and that's how you feel aligned how did you get introduced to this work or this set of thoughts and beliefs and mindsets was it something that you had since you were a kid or where did you start exploring mm -hmm. with the idea of being present experiencing feeling yeah. delivery? the present moment is recent because you know what? I didn't need, I felt almost like I didn't need to be present, I guess, when I was coming up because there wasn't anything pulling me away from the present moment. I kind of only had the present moment, if that makes sense. It was just me and Boogus in the basement making songs and that was it. There wasn't tours coming up and videos, is it, we, you know, there was none of that. So, uh, but as this past year and past couple of years have been happening, I got into the Power of Now book and just sort of just the whole ideology around just being present and started reading more into that whole theory. And I just, I bought, you know, I bought into it. A lot of this stuff, people don't realize that a lot of this stuff, like the teachings, the self-help stuff, you have to be open to receiving it, you know? And if you're not open to receiving it and you're not willing to buy into it, then I, you know, I hear you, but... God bless, you know, I can only tell people what works for me, um, but it worked for me, you know, mm. being present. Yeah. I love that you mentioned the power of now. And then when you talk about flow state, yeah. Uh, for anyone who's listening, if you've not read that book, it's a brilliant book as well. Flow state. Flo I haven't read that Yeah. Book. It's called flow. Wow. And for anyone who doesn't know flow, the way it's defined in that book is where your skills meet your challenge. Exactly. So it talks I saw like a YouTube video and yeah. that's, that was like enough for me. I should, re <laughs> yeah. I should read the book though. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no. But you brought it up and it's a, it's a brilliant concept and you're really experiencing is. that because most people, it says, experience when their challenge is above their skills and so they feel frustrated, disappointed. Yeah, and then they give up. Yeah, or their skills are above their challenge and then they feel bored because they yeah. actually have more skills than what they're trying to achieve. And I think that's, I fell into that a little bit, which is why I started working with outside producers because it was so easy for me to just like go downstairs and make like a rust song, you know, like I have a million beats, I can make it be boom, do this. And it's like, all right, cool, whatever. You know, but it, it kind of, I got into like a rut creatively because I was making songs, but I was like, I don't even, it just wasn't even that fun, you know? And I think it was because it wasn't that challenging anymore. So um, I started working with outside producers where it was like, okay, this is a bit of a challenge. And then further, I started trying to get on beats. Even if no one hears them, I started to get on production that I don't like in mm -hmm. a sense. Almost to just be like, can I make a song out of this? Wow. Yeah, just like because I got the studio in my house and I don't need anyone to record me. So I can just be down there like experimenting. So there's been beats that producers send me and I'm like, I don't like this at all, but I wonder if I can make a song out of it. And it becomes this cool little like fun project. And a lot of times it's turned into songs that I'm like, this is crazy. 
Wow. Like I, I get so much more fulfillment out of it because I couldn't see it coming. A lot of my songs, I'm like, before you know, when I'm making the beat, I already know what the whole song's gonna sound like. And most of those usually end up being very successful, so I'm not gonna downplay them. But it does make the process not as uh, um, on an Easter egg hunt. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I love hearing that because that's putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Right. And right. most of us avoid that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like most of us just wanna hear a beat and feel something straight away. Right. Well, see, because people are around other people. I would never, I would probably never do that if there was people in the studio yeah. with me, like, Actually, out of all the beats you played, <laughs> give me the one I don't like, and I'm just gonna try to make some. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like that's why I always tell people whatever your craft is, make sure you have it in your house if you can, mm. because those moments of solitude when you can kind of just be weird and you know experiment and dance around crazy and be nuts, that's where you're really gonna. You know, I have a I have a line where I say the public praises people for what they practice in private. Mm. You know, so. Uh, I just feel like that's when you got to hone in on everything is what you're doing in private. So I like, when I'm by myself in the studio, I be getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> what's the, can you tell us what's the weirdest thing that's ever happened? <laughs> I mean, it's not that weird, but, <laughs> but it's just like when I'm by myself, I'll put on a beat that I'm like, I don't even know what I'm about to do on this. And I'll just put the auto tune all the way up and go stand in the booth for 60 takes, yeah. just wailing and just making noises. And I'll be like, this is wild or this is trash or this was really cool. Yeah. You know, like I sent my manager some song I did uh, where I made a beat and I just put the auto tune on full blast and just freestyled the whole song. And I was like, I just had to get it out. Yeah. But it was cool. But like, I would never put it out, but it was awesome. Dude, this is so inspiring. <laughs> I, I, that's, I love that approach. It's, yeah. It's just, it's so refreshing hearing that. Well, it's a refreshing process, yeah. you know, because you get so rigid mm. with like your process and this is what I do. And we sit here and I make this kind of song. It's like every once in a while you have to shake the snow globe. That's yeah. where that whole yeah. concept came from. You have to just, you know, it's like the Tin Man in <laughs> Wizard, Wizard of Oz. Of Oz like yeah. turn the auto tune up and put on some crazy beat and let me just be a maniac for an hour. Yeah. It breaks the formula. It we, does. We work in this formulaic yeah, it does. Uh, product line manufacturing. Right. And you don't, you can't manufacture greatness. And that's so. from school. Yeah. That's from school. School is such a factory setup, you know. The How were you at school? What kind of school? I was incredible at school, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie. I was, I was just like, I'm really not. I was not one of those like, yeah, I struggled in school and it was difficult. I was really, really good at school because I wouldn't apply myself, but I was definitely the kid who like, didn't study, never did homework, but I would get A's and B's on all the tests. And oh, so nice. everyone was just like, but I would be like, you know, I was second, I always say this, and it's not even something I'm necessarily proud of, but it just gives context. But like a senior superlative, I was uh, like second for most likely to make a teacher retire. Mm. Cause I was just the kid in class, like constantly talking, distracting people, challenging the teacher, but I had an A in the class. So I was just super annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Which I know is a surprise to so many people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so tell me, go back to the point you were making before, before I interjected around why you think that factory, yes. Well, yeah, because you know, you're, you have an expiration date as a kid in school. You gotta be out by a certain time in high school, whatever age it is. Uh, go to this department of the building when the bell rings. You know what I mean? It's just very like, burp, burp, burp. like there's no creativity in there. You know, that's why I'm really big on having arts in schools and, you know, just because otherwise you just, I don't know, just like creates these robots. I love that you break the mold. How do you get to a point though where you've, what I find fascinating, already your process is fascinating to me. What I find more interesting though, is that you're a, your ability to trust yourself yeah. when you come up with something insane. Yeah. Because very few people ever allow themselves to do a wild card thing. Right. Now, when you do a wild card thing in the studio on your own and you discover something like a sound or a yeah. auto tune or whatever it is, and you discover a, a, a beat or a sound that yeah. you're like, oh, I like this. How do you then trust yourself to go with that when now when you play it to someone, they might be like, all right, you're crazy, Russ. Like, this is never going to work. How do you then approach that? It's that level of, it's that stain of confidence that's just, you can't remove. I just still, oh, like, Nas has this quote in an interview, I believe, where he said, if it doesn't scare you, you shouldn't put it out. Mm. So I've always kind of like kept that in the back of my head. You know, I usually move with that. 
and I'm and I'm cool with that. And I like that with my fans. What I've created is this trust and this unpredictable, uh, un predictably unpredictable sort of relationship where they know they can expect me to be doing the unexpected meeting. They know it might be raps. They know it might be singing, but they don't know what it's going to sound like, but they know it's going to be me. And so I think I've done a very good job at painting my canvas and kind of giving people who I am. So it's allowed me a lot of creative freedom. I always tell up and coming artists, like when you're coming up, you don't want to then, this is my opinion, when you're coming up and you're building your fan base, you're conditioning them to expect a certain thing from you, a certain sound or whatever. And you're, you're creating this creative window. A lot of people, if you just come up only rapping, right? And you get your whole fan base off of only rapping. Let's say, you know, you just, you haven't really fully tapped into you yet. And now you want to start singing. A lot of fans are going to be like, you switched up. What are you doing? Did it. And, you know, you could lose a lot of people and they might think that you're changing when really the whole time that's been you. You just didn't have enough time to discover it. So I was really proud of myself that I was able to kind of give people the whole scope of my creativity so that when I do go left field, no one's going to be like, what are you doing? Because it's kind of like, oh, yeah, that's Russ just being Russ. Like, we know that sometimes he's giving us red, sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it's orange, whatever, you know? That's kind of why I did the artworks all like that, too. Yeah. Just to let you know that all my music is all different colors. It's not just one. Just spending this time with you already and even when you came in and stuff, like you're someone who's who's very comfortable in their own skin, but at the same time you're not arrogant and egotistic. Really? And so wow. I don't you, feel did it. everyone I'm hear that? Feeling, yeah, I'm just... <laughs> that's I'm a just, first. You know. <laughs> no, um, I agree in, too. I think I bought into the own narrative. <laughs> yeah, Breezy like, doesn't have an ego. I love it. No, no, I definitely no, have an ego. No, I mean in the sense of... Let, yeah, let's talk about ego for a bit because... And, and I mean it in a good way. I, I was saying it as a compliment that I feel that you have a very... Uh, you know, what, from what I'm hearing or at least... And I'm, I'm only basing on this conversation I've had with you, but... Mm -hmm. It's like there's a stability between like knowing you want to learn more and be better, yeah. But you are confident about who you are and, and sure. where you are, which is which is a beautiful place to be, by the way. Like, thank you. Who doesn't want to be between those two things? Yeah. Uh, how have you tempered that ego that we all have mm -hmm. with the desire to learn and grow and realize there's more to go? But I'm really happy with what I've done because yeah. that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. But I want to kind of break that down for people because I think a lot of people live in either extreme. Either they're celebrating their last win right. for like seven years. Right. Or they're just like, oh, I'm the worst. I'm never going to win. I'm right. never going to win. And they don't appreciate where they are. Yeah. I think for me, to be honest, despite perception or whatever, um, I had to hype myself up. I had to be the biggest believer of myself. That's the only reason why any of this worked. And I think that, and because I'm very vocal about it, because I'm putting it out into the universe so that it comes back, it could come off like I think I have nothing left to learn and no nobody can offer me anything and I know it. It's like, no, y'all just don't know what self-belief sounds like, clearly. Um, you might know what it looks like and some people are just more um, quiet about their self-belief just to get people to like them. Otherwise, you get kind of my perception. But um, <laughs> But no, I've always still been a massive fan of people and a massive just supporter of anything dope. Anyone anyone that knows me from when I was nothing to now, from two years old to now, like if you're dope at anything, I'm always the first person to like root for you, DM you, send you advice, like bro, hit me anytime. And even just looking up to people, I'm, I'm a fan out. I'm like, yo, you're incredible. I would love to work with you. I'm that person too. So I don't know. I just, there's, it's the duality. You are able to have the utmost confidence in yourself while still also knowing that, okay, but this person is really dope too. And if we come together, it could be really fire. I'm just really confident in myself. And so I'm not desperate to reach after collabs and things like that. But it doesn't mean I don't think that I know everything. And, you know, I'm always asking all my, like, my engineer friends, like, yo, what plugin is that? Like, this is crazy, yo, you're fire. You know, and people get, so you, you could ask even like Kid Super. When I first met him, the dude who made this sweater, um, he did my Gypsy video years ago, like 2014. And when I first met him, he thought I was hella weird because, or like socially awkward, because I kept giving him mad compliments. 
because I was so, it was like my first real kind of video-ish, even though it wasn't like some big production, but I was just so enamored by the process and I thought it was so dope that I'm just like, that's who I am. I'm a very complimentary person and like, I'm always going to give people their flowers. And he was just like, I'm like, nah, I genuinely feel like that. So I don't know. I've always been able to have that level of duality. Yeah. I love, I love the idea of that, that paradox. Like it feels yeah. like a, it feels like it's not allowed. Like it sounds like it should not be possible to think both those things. Yeah. But actually that's where all the magic happens. I agree. Right. Like that you, we always think, no, you have to choose, you have to decide or you're either or, but actually hearing you say that, yeah, actually I, I think both those things. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that. And I love how that doesn't stop you from appreciating others. Yeah. Uh, who was it that appreciated your sound earlier on that you think made a difference to you and, and may, you know, guided you or was it just you for yourself? It was me and probably Boogus. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, for the longest time, it was just Boogus rapping and me producing. And that was uh, my closest example of like someone who I thought had really good taste and I trusted their opinion artistically. So when Boogus gave me the green light to be like, yo, yeah, you should rap, it was just kind of like, okay, well, game over for everyone else. Like, if Boogus thinks it's tight, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, and that's how it still is. Like, um, you know, you, it's, it's important to have, you only need one, but it's important to have at least one person who believes in you sometimes almost more than you. Mm. And, and there is no jealousy or weird, uh, you can't win. Cause then I won't win. Like, it's a very weird thing. So I always, you know, commend Boogie for being like the best friend you could have in something that I'm doing. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. I, I like what you brought up there about men specifically, like, and you took me straight back to like my teenage years where yeah. I'd be best friend with a dude and he'd be like my brother, but then we'd go out and he'd be like, all right, let's see who can get more girls today. Right? right. Like that would be his mentality or like, or like, oh, let's see who will be better at the sport today. Or, and it was every time I've realized that everyone in my life or male relationships, if every time a guy, a friend of mine has tried to turn a friendship into a competition, yeah, they haven't lasted in my life. Yeah. Like they're no longer in my life because I just wanted to be friends. Well, now don't I, get me wrong. Yeah. Me and Boogus, dumb competitive. Okay, so exp explain. We played basketball together. Like right. anything me and Boogus will turn into a competition for sure. But when it comes to a dream you're following after, like it's never like, yo, how many streams did your song do, bro? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's never been that. How do you build that balance? What is it about him and what is it about you that allows you to build that kind of a friendship? Because I think that's rare. Yeah, I do too. Especially in today's social media world, stream yeah. world. I mean, followers, views, yeah. comments, engagement, all this stuff that we all talk about. I think we're both trying to do the same thing, you know? And we're both, uh, we were both real friends before all this. And we both understood you know, we read Napoleon Hill, so we understand the power of a mastermind. And we just, as big of egos as me and him have, we never let it get in the way of like supporting one another and any of that, you know? So I don't know. I just think it comes down to the person. Like, how real are you? <laughs> you know, some people are just fake. It is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that, and that idea of being able to have at least even one person. Just like one. You said, That's just all you one. need. You don't yeah. need... Yeah, because sometimes we try and we want 10 or 20 right. like that. And you're right, for most of us, no. we're lucky to have one. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a good enough start. You mentioned Napoleon Hill and Mastermind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, what age were you when you read that book? 17. Boogus gave me the book. So Boogus was putting me on to a lot of that stuff. He put me on to Napoleon Hill. He put me on to The Alchemist. Um, you know, so that's the thing. We weren't just like the, I would say the like typical 17, 18 year olds, you know, hanging out. We graduated high school 17 and we just were locked in the studio from then until now, you know? So it was a lot of self-discovery, but out the gate, once we left high school, we were reading those books. So it was just kind of like, we were ready to go mentally. Like we read those books and we were, we're both the kind of, the kind of people that we buy into something quick. And then we latch onto it and then that's that. <laughs> you know, if that's what we believe, you can't tell us anything different. You know, like if I'm, go I went vegan for a year because I watched one documentary and like, that was that. Like once something clicks in my brain, I'm done. 
You know what I mean? Like right now I haven't had bread or grains in two weeks because I just like woke up and it clicked. Like my brother, the nutritionist told me and I latched onto him. Boom, that's it. I've like, me and him have always been very good at just, once we decide something, that's what it is. He lost a bunch of weight, you know, 30, 40 pounds because he just decided I'm done, you know? So once me and him decided this is what we were doing with our lives, there was no, yeah, but maybe we're not doing it with our lives or it, it, this was it. And we were both fully committed and every day and every, like every second of our lives was committed to this, you know? That requires such a level of discipline to like yeah. make a choice and to stick with it. And I find like that's something a lot of us struggle with today. Like I'm terrible at discipline yeah. and I've always been terrible at work ethic, well, but, to, like but then I realized that it was the work and not my work ethic. It was the work, you know, I didn't have good work ethic in school because I didn't like the work. It's not hard to get up and do something you love every day. And I think I think people get judged off their work ethic incorrectly because they get judged, their work ethic is judged off of how well and how consistent they're doing work they don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. How can you how can you judge somebody off of that? Yeah. Judge me off of, you know, what I love. That's how I can really tell if you're about it or not. Like you say you love this. You say you love basketball, and I know you do. But you just, you're not putting in the work. That's how I know you're not really about it. Now I can judge you accurately. Mm. But if you're like, if you're a basketball player and you love basketball, but, um, you know, somebody's judging you off of how well you do uh, paintings and every day you're in the art studio, that's not even fair. I love that. What, what do you think is the most difficult thing you've been through personally? Like what's been a moment, a time in your life where you felt you were really battling with something to overcome it? 2018 was pretty rough for me uh, just because when I was 17 and I had this vision of what my life was going to be and what it was going to be like to be on and successful and a musician and money and fame and whatever, uh, I had this very innocent, like, just the world is made out of like marshmallows and cotton candy perspective on it, you know? And when I got on, it started off like that, but then it very quickly turned and I got this very nasty side of like fame where there's a lot of negativity and hate and narratives and things that are out of your control and things that are so frustrating and trying to fight everything. Cause I'm, I'm a fighter, you know, and I'm competitive and I don't, I don't like just rolling over. So this isn't a broken version of success. This just, is success. This comes with it too. I didn't like, I didn't plan for that. I thought like once you get on, everything is perfect and everything is fine. Cause that's what you think when you're 17. So, um, that was tough. Just like the dose of reality of like, oh, okay, this is not what I thought it was going to be, but that has to be okay because this is what it is. That's such a brilliant thought that you just said that it wasn't a broken version of success. That just was success. <laughs> yeah. And it's so interesting because you're so right that when we're teens, we think we're going to get to a place where it doesn't matter. And even now, I think a lot of people look at people like yourself and other people that we both may know yeah. in our lives, and people just be like, oh, yeah, but that, that person's life, everything probably just works out just right. the way they well, want that's, it. Well, like, that's what's so frustrating, right, is that people on the outside looking in, their response to everything any famous person is going through is, you have millions of dollars, why do you care about anything? It's like, what do y'all think money is? According to most people's theory, once you have fame and money, you have no emotions. That's it. You're no longer a human is what you're trying to tell me. I shouldn't feel sadness. I shouldn't feel anything because I have money and fame. It's like, okay, let's run with that. Fine. I'll buy into that for the sake of the conversation. However, if you're telling me now that because of money, I'm above certain human emotions, then you're telling me I'm above you. So now when I act like I'm above you, don't now also come back and say, why are you acting like you're better than me? Well, you just told me I'm better than you because I don't even have the same emotions you have. So which one is it? Am I better than you or do I experience the same emotions as you? It can't be both. Mm. That's why I encourage people on the outside looking in to just shut up. <laughs> you know, it's like in, just... in, in, in a, I'll take a more compassionate, empathetic line, but yes, in, in the same idea of, yes, like the idea of, I, and I love the way you explained that. I think it's a, it's a great way of cutting through the noise yeah. because it's, it's so easy because also when we think 
someone is safe yeah. from human emotion because of money and fame, then we think when we get money and fame, we will also be free right. of right. human emotion. And so then you're in for a rude awakening. Right, exactly. We're projecting it onto you, but then you're setting the same standard for yourself yeah. of I hope, and, I, and literally I've heard, I think every person who's rich and famous will say the same thing. It's yeah. just like, hey, this, yeah. was, this is what it really ended up as. Go on, sorry. And it, no, no, no. And it doesn't matter what any rich and famous person says. Everyone on the outside looking in won't believe it. Yeah. They'll be like, nah, that won't be me though. Yeah. And it's like, I, you know what? I hear you. I was there too. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I think, I think the beauty of understanding is understanding when you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I always say that. I think there's understanding in understanding that you don't understand. Yeah. Like a lot of people need to accept that you don't get it. Yeah. And that is being compassionate. Yeah. Like I can hear you, but it doesn't mean that I feel you. It doesn't mean that I get it. You know, that, well, that's sad. it. That's it. Well said, man. That is so true. I, I think that was, yeah, that's such a great definition of compassion that you just gave. Because I think even when, like, it's even when someone calls you up and said, hey, my, my parent just, I had a friend tell me this, my parent just got diagnosed with stage four cancer. Yeah. It's like, I, I can't empathize. I, I've never no. been in that position. Yeah. So I can't be like, oh, I feel you. I, I get it. Right. I have to understand that I don't understand. That you don't understand. That I don't understand. But that is understanding correct yes. yeah yes and, and sometimes that's all people are looking for in those moments is just like i just want you to be here and present i don't expect you to get it you yeah. know it's the people who try to act like they get it yeah. that actually makes you feel even more alone mm. it's like wow you're really showing me that you have no clues going on yeah you and know? i mean when you're talking about this time in your life the 2018 when you're experiencing success not broken success yeah in your words what are you learning at that time? Like, what is the, what's, we've, we kind of know what you're learning, but what's your process of- Getting of, out of it? Yeah, of figuring it out even before Letting you go. try and get out of it. Letting go of my hold onto what it needs to be. That was the ego. The ego was like, it's supposed to be like this though. And it's, it's supposed to be what it is, you know? And once I let go of all of that, and then that's why I came out with Shake the Snow Globe, because I realized I just needed to- reset and unjade i was like man it is what it is yeah it just is what it is like it's it's what it's supposed to be and as long as i'm still operating from a place of love and a place of wanting to share um i'm gonna be all right yeah. it'll be what it needs to be you know <laughs> and that time is also what led to the book in 2019 it's all in your head which it was all in my head a lot of times in my life i kind of sometimes accidentally speak things into existence so i had the title of it's all in your head for years. Mm -hmm. Like I always had this idea of writing that. Um, from a positive standpoint, obviously, like, you know, manifesting and self-belief and all those things. But it's funny that I had this title, it's all in your head, right? You're your own worst enemy or your your own biggest fan, you pick, whatever it is. And then while I have this title, 2018 happens and I'm losing to myself mentally. You know, I had to snap out of it, you know. So it was just one of those things where I needed to like listen to my own <laughs> advice and be like, bro, it's all in your head now, <laughs> you know, like, but now on the negative side. Yeah. But it's a choice at this point. Do you want to fight everything and fight the whole world or do you want to let it go? Yeah. And was writing the book quite therapeutic in that? Because I almost feel like yeah. when you're writing a book called It's All In Your Head, it's far more simpler to go inward because yeah. you're kind of dealing with topics and themes that worked for you. What was the biggest thing that you put in the book that you felt was what helped you overcome and work Man, that whole stuff? book, and especially the process of it, it was like an interview. So I had this woman who would come and she had the tape recorder and I had all the chapters mapped out, like what I was, you know, because it was all song titles. So I knew what the chapters were going to be. I knew what I was going to talk about. Um, I just needed somebody to help me organize all my thoughts. So she would come with the tape recorder and just we would go chapter by chapter and she would say, okay, we'll talk about manifesting what it means to you. And I would just talk. And so it was really like a week and a half of therapy sessions. And then we organized all of it together and I, you know, did my stuff and whatever. And it was like, man, this was it. That's why I love that book. Cause it's really me. Like that was me talking to a therapist for a week and a half in a book. I know? love, yeah. yeah. And how amazing is that, that people yeah. have that accessible to them. Right. Because if everyone could have a diary of them being in therapy, right. I think that would be phenomenal like, yeah. to, to be able to look back and, and work through it. 
you've, you've mentioned manifestation a, fo- a few times and, and I think you've taught us some really, in my opinion, again, very personal and refreshing ways. Yeah. We hear about the word a lot mm-hmm. and randomly, you're obviously someone who believes it, lives it, knows it, is experiencing it. What is the process that you have practiced for you that has yeah. worked for you that others could understand? Because I think there's a lot of like misconceptions around it, but for someone who it's working for and someone who believes in it, yeah. how would you describe it for you? It's yourself? that knowing thing you were talking about. It's not necessarily just seeing it, oh, I can see myself with money and then like, then that's it. Now you're going to get money. It's more so knowing it and also feeling it and and not just like, excuse me, not just, oh, like I said, you can see the beach house you bought your mom. It's, it's what does it feel like though? What it, like... What does it feel like when you see your mom's reaction to getting the beach house? And can you can you feel that? Can you feel the car turning the corner to the beach house? It's about immersing yourself in that feeling as if it was going on right now. And when you do that on a daily basis, it's not long before reality catches up with your thoughts, you know? And like I said, it just has to be something you believe and buy into this whole theory you know if you believe that we are just the universe experiencing itself and you know we're all in tune and connected to the infinite and all these things then you're going to be fine as far as as far as this you know method goes but if you don't then it's not for you you know and, and was, was that the best thing you manifested the beach house yeah. uh it was one of them for sure yeah. but just like this whole career man just this whole life was a complete uh, product of law of attraction, but also being proactive. I wasn't just sitting That's what there. I was gonna ask you, yeah. yeah, no, you don't just like click your heels and go back to Kansas. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, tell us uh, about the work. Tell yeah. us about the product. The, the actual like. So we get it. The the immersion, the feeling. Yeah, which, and I know you're doing the other part too. Tell us about the strategy, the the networking, the the yeah, the actual skill. Yeah, because you have to have a skill, right? Well, skill can get developed. You know, skill is developed. I was not the most skilled when I started at all. All of it sucked. So, um, you know, you develop skill through repetition and through practice and putting in the work. But yeah, I don't think people understand that you actually need to put in the work and be persistent. You just also have to couple it with a very positive mindset. But you know, uh, Will Smith talks about. Um, the concept of, and I've like mentioned this a lot, like laying a brick a day until you have a wall. Mm. You know, I think his dad took them, you know the story I'm talking about? They like did the brick a day. Like, how are we going to build a wall? And you go out there and you lay a brick a day. So I really resonate with that whole um, story and concept. And I think it's really true. I think a lot of people are just focused on the whole bigger picture and like, how am I going to be this famous musician? Like, I haven't even made a song yet. It's like, you're not supposed to be thinking about like, all that to the point where it's daunting and crippling. You're just supposed to, you know what? I know I'm going to get there. I can feel what it's like. But in the meantime, I'm going to lay a brick a day. I'm going to make a song a day or make a beat a day or find samples every day or study every day. Like as long as you're doing something towards the bigger picture, a small thing every day, you're good. That's yeah. real. That's yeah. real. And that, and that's how it has to be built. Yeah. Everyone always think it's like that, the wallet analogy that you're talking about. You kind of just turn up. I was thinking about that one day. I was I was looking out into the city of L.A., and I was just thinking, like, someone had to think about this. Right. And I was in Dubai recently. I was thinking the same. It's like, it's just a desert. It's a, no, it's a bunch of ideas. Yeah, and someone had to think about it first. Like, they would have looked out onto, like, desert and, yeah. and had to think about it. But we don't think about that because we walk into a city. You walk into, every, like, that's what I find fascinating is that every day you're walking around in somebody's idea. That's how you know thoughts are powerful. Like mm. we're sitting in so, like this chair was somebody's idea to make it look like this and the cushions to be this soft and these shoes. So, like you're just constantly surrounded by other people's ideas. And I think the really cool thing about free will is contributing your ideas back into the infrastructure of what's already going on. That's so powerful, man. Yeah. That, what you just said now is so powerful. How how do we how do we know if our idea is good or is that even the right question? I don't think that's the right question. I think, I think, is it serviceable? You know, does it help? Mm. You know, is it just for you or is it, are you serving a bigger purpose? That's why I think music is really great because we're, you know, it's a service for the world we're providing, you know, big or small, however you want to quantify it is on you, but it's definitely a service that we're providing. And I realized, you know, after I got money and fame and whatever, um, 
I was like, man, the whole point of this, like I had, I literally said this to myself the other day in the shower. This is where all my ideas happen. <laughs> and I don't Why feel bad. About, I don't feel bad about that because Pharrell said the same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but I literally just blurted out. I was like, I need more money so I can help more people. It was just like a thing that blurted out. And I was like, I was like, yeah, that's the whole point of all this. I had this like epiphany where I was like, I'm 28. I made it. The only thing left to do is obviously I keep making it, but it's to help other people make it, you know? And I just think that our goal is to just give. And I think there's a very uh, misled sort of idea that we're supposed to be getters. Mm. And I think um, Bugis actually mentioned this concept to me about being a go-giver instead of a go-getter. I think a lot of times, especially with music, success, fame, we're just thinking about what can we get, you know, and what can I get from the world when I put this song out and so on and so forth. But it's more so about what can I give to the world? Tell me about a message or a piece of fan mail or an experience you've had with a fan or a listener that made you realize how impactful music is on someone. I'm sure you've had some phenomenal and you know, right? it's so many, man, to yeah. be honest. And I'm so fortunate that yeah. it's so many, but every day people are sending me messages of you saved my life and you meet people and they're crying their eyes out. Cause it's like, you helped them so much. And that's, you know, that's when you realize it's just way bigger than you, you know, it's just way bigger than you. And like I said, I think I'm just excited to keep giving to the world. And I know that could sound cliche and like, you don't believe that I'm actually that generous, but it's really like, you know, anyone around me knows, like I'm always trying to help, you know, I'm always trying to like give people money or whatever, just because it's like, that's, you know, my mom told me a long time ago, um, when I first started getting money, she said, uh, money is meant to change people's realities. And so if you have the ability to do it, you should. So I get a kick out of just like, you know, I'll see a fan on Twitter and they're like raising money for like their dance program. And I'm just like, here, or, you know, a kid will send me a DM, like, you know, my mom's funeral. And I'm just like, why not? You know, and I don't need to post about it. It's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to give it back. And I, and I think I'm also a very big believer in not blocking the natural flow of the universe and I think money is a force of energy and when you get it and you're just focused on keeping it you're gonna lose it mm -hmm. so I always get money and give it right back and I think that's why it keeps coming in yeah. I just give it away yeah and it's given in your own way right like I think what I love about what you're saying and, and you're talking about the cliche of giving to me it's you figured out how you like giving yeah and and that's yeah. what matters for all of us because yeah. some people are going to do charity work some sure. people are going to build schools some people are going to support the people around them some people are going to help yeah a person on twitter or whatever who who can't even pay for their right. mother's funeral or whatever it is like you know the point is of supporting in the way you can yeah and in the way you feel called to yeah because that's all you have and it tripped me out when like i said when boogies brought this concept to me and go giver yeah go giver and and i was like man I never fully understood the complete reason why I got so much out of life already. And he was like, it's because you gave so much. Mm. And I never thought about it like that. But, you know, when you think about, you know, I have more songs out than some of the veterans in the game, most of them. You know, I got 500 songs. I just like the game I give to try, like... I give a lot and I don't think about it while I'm doing it. I'm like, I'm about to give this so I can get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm just like giving it because I naturally want to do that. But it makes a lot of sense that, you know, givers get more than the getters. Yeah. You know? And even when you're giving and it's not even being loved or received that way, but you continue to give. Yeah. Because sometimes it's easy to give when everyone's kind of like, oh, we Receiving love you and they give you yeah. the validation. But sometimes you're just giving because- Well, see, but if you're only giving it to get something back, then you're not giving me anything, you're loaning it. Mm. That's what I always tell people. I, I, like women, I don't care who it is, don't give me love if you're only giving it to get something back. Then it's conditional. And it's not giving, you're loaning me love. Mm. You're, you're only loaning me love for an extended period of time until I give it back. I don't do that. I, I give love and give game and give money and whatever it is. I don't expect anything back. 
I give it because that feels like the right thing to do and it aligns with my spirit. How do you feel or how do you respond when you realize someone just loaned it to you when you thought that they were giving I it? I expect most people to act like that. Right. Because most people are like that. Most people are out for self. They're very self-serving. And so I know that most people are operating from a place of I'm not doing any favors and I'm not doing anything for free. And so I'm not really surprised. I'm not that naive. You know, I think you can be, you can be naive if you want to the point of like, I really thought you were just helping me out. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay. You know, I don't assume anyone's just helping me out. I, I like you get in trouble and you get your feelings hurt when you assume people are as kind as you. Mm. Or people, you know, not to be like, I'm the most kind person ever, but you can get your feelings hurt if you assume everyone is like you. Mm -hmm. That's when you get disappointed and, you know, and you suffer. And the whole thing with suffering, it comes from attachment. So if you get attached to the idea that, oh, well, they're going to operate how I'm operating, you're going to suffer, yeah. you know? So I try not to get attached to anything really. Yeah, That's the only time people suffer is when there's attachment involved. Yeah, You know, you're not going to freak out if a water bottle right here gets like burned or your table gets burned, you're not that attached to the table, you know? So that's when you got to like choose in life what you're, what's worth getting attached to, which I really think it's people and animals, people and pets. It's about it. Yeah. You know, everything else is pretty replaceable yeah. off top of my head. Yeah. I'm going to add people, pets and purpose. We'll add a third one. Sure. Yeah. People, pets and purpose. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. But even the purpose, it's hard, you know, you get so attached to that. You can suffer a lot along the way yeah. if things don't go the way you want them. That's that's what happened to me in 2018. Mm -hmm. I was suffering because it wasn't going the way I was attached to. And once I let go of that attachment to how I thought it was supposed to go, I was fine. Yeah. You know, sure, there's dips in here and there, but for the most part, I'm good. Yeah. You know? I yeah. I always say to people, you you get to where you want in life, just not in the way you imagined it. Yeah. Or uh, when. Yeah. Or when you imagined it. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge, right? It's like you have reality. <laughs> And then you have your projector screen up here. Yeah. And you're trying to make this projector screen happen, but but this is reality right now. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you're actually going through. Just have faith that whatever you want, you're gonna get it in whatever life you want, you're you're gonna achieve it. But it doesn't matter when. That should be irrelevant. You know, you have you can't put a deadline on your own success. It's crazy. Yeah. It ruins people. You know, you know those people that are like, by 30, if I don't have to. And it's like, then what's what's going to happen at 30 if you don't? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, what happens? <laughs> you know? Totally. It's and you crazy. don't know when. Yeah, you don't. Like, you know, you're 28 now. Like, my, my life took off externally. Internally, my journey started at 16. Sure. But externally, my journey started at 28. Wow. And so, See? you know, I'm 33 now. And, yeah. and, it's, and it's just interesting. It's like, you just don't know when, what's no. going to happen. And, and you just... But you trusted the what? But and you, you believed trust, in yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Trust the what. Yeah. yeah. That's that's really beautiful, man. Dude, this has been like, this has been one of the most refreshing conversations yeah. I've had in a long time. Nice. Like, I love how you've brought everything you've learned along the way and made it so practical. Yeah. In your Well, I've had to life. make sense of my whole everything. Like, yeah, but I you've think, really made sense of it. Like, when I'm listening you. to you, I'm like, wow, like, this is, you know, you can tell that. Russ has reflected and deeply yeah. intern internalized yeah. these concepts because it's really easy to say the stuff, uh, but the practical aspects of it, of how you live it, yeah. is what's blown me away. Yeah, like, I appreciate it. Well, I always yeah. tell people, being a musician, uh, it's such a self-discovery thing. Like you learn just so much about yourself and the universe when you're an artist and you're, you know, it's just, I don't, it's such about like diving deep into the depths of yourself and discovering you. And it's when you're making, when, you, when you're the type of artist I feel like I am, which is, I'm trying to talk about the truth. I'm trying to help people. I had to kind of, those self-help books and just kind of moving through this journey, I had to find the way to apply all of this stuff to my life in a practical, practical, productive way. You can tell, man. Yeah. You can tell. It's Thank real. you. But Thank yeah, we, you. we end every interview, the final five. So this is a rapid fire, fast okay. five. Sick. So you're going to answer every question in one word or one sentence maximum. Fire. So that's for every one of them. Easy for you. You're, you're a lyricist and, <laughs> yeah. and you know, you've, you, this will be easy for you. All right. The first question is, uh, what's the best advice you've ever received? What if it can turn out better than you can imagine? Second question, what's the worst advice you've ever received? Be realistic. <laughs> nice. That's good. That's a good one. 
All right, third question. What's one thing you're trying to learn or grow and develop right now? More of a affinity and appreciation for the present moment. Mm. Mm, I like that. All right, question number four. What's one thing that you think other people value but you don't value? I don't know. What do people value that I think is dumb? Um, Crocs. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Good answer. All right. I agree. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. Fifth and final question. Uh, if you could create one law in the world that everyone had to follow, what would it be? The golden rule, bro, <laughs> that they teach you in fifth grade. <laughs> like, <laughs> do unto others as they would. You know what I mean? If everyone had to only treat people the way that they would be treated, I think obviously the world would be in a much better spot. You'd be much more conscious of like, all right, maybe I shouldn't do this. But the thing that's funny about that, I always laugh when people think they get away with something. You didn't. There's always, to me, I believe the universe is seeing everything. Jay Electronica has this line where he's, the universe is listening, be careful what you're saying. It, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you might think you got over on me, you didn't. Somebody saw, yeah. you know, good luck, enjoy that. And the worst thing is you saw somewhere deep inside of yourself. Yeah. And you that's have to the live. worst one, I yeah. feel. Like that's the one that eats you up the most. Everyone, Russ, this has been honestly one of my favorite conversations. Thank you. Had. That was really there awesome. There are so many things you shared that I hope everyone who's listening and watching is going to go back and listen to watch and write notes. <laughs> uh, I didn't tell you at the start, but now I'm like, you should have taken notes because wow. this is one of those episodes where there were just so many practical examples of not listening to people's opinions, finding mm -hmm. solitude for your creativity, allowing yourself to be wild and insane on yeah. your own so you can discover new things about yourself, uh, the ability to balance confidence with humility at the same time. I mean, you've just been dropping uh, bars you. the no, whole I time. I and really like the way you framed all the questions, though, because it had me thinking in ways I wasn't... Like, I never really thought about the duality of the ego while also being a fan and just being, I never told anyone about being crazy in the studio when you're by yourself, like the auto-tune thing. And I know. love that. That was yeah. one of my favorite things. But yeah. no, I appreciate it, man. And I hope everyone who's listening and watching, uh, go and grab a copy of Russ's book. It's all in your head. It will yes. be a great read for you if you love this conversation. And yeah. of course, uh, all the music, all the albums. Thank but you. Uh, thank you for coming on On Purpose, man. And we hope we can have you back for part two. For sure. Uh, Thanks for this, having me. Yeah, we should do this regularly because I feel yeah. like it'll be nice to see your evolution yeah. uh, and your growth as time goes on. Yeah, So awesome. I love you, man. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Bro. Thank you. Everyone who's listening and watching, thank you for watching On Purpose. And I want you to tag me and Russ on Instagram with the things that stood out to you on Twitter as well. What is it that you heard? What is it that he said that you just can't stop thinking about and you want to share with your friends? Make sure you tag both of us. I love noticing what really resonates with you guys. Uh, thank you again for listening and watching. We'll see you next time. If you want even more videos just like this one, make sure you subscribe and click on the boxes over here. I'm also excited to let you know that you can now get my book, Think Like a Monk, from thinklikeamonkbook.com. Check below in the description to make sure you order today.